Dobar dan ili dobro večer, ne znam kako se tretira ovaj dio dana. Moja funkcija ovdje jeste da vam poželim dobrodošlicu i da ova kakofonija malo me prekida. Hoće li bliže? E, u redu. Znači, kao što sam počela pričati, moja funkcija ovdje jeste da vam poželim dobrodošlicu, da komentaršim kako je zaista lijepo vidjeti gužvu u ovakvom malom prostoru. To pokazuje konkretan interes za jednu umjetnost i mislim da to jeste bio cilj kada se osnivao Bukstan, sada već u osmi po redu. Ispred nas su tri dana koja su puna programa i jutro smo bili, vjerovatno većina nas, na mnogim dešavanjima ovo tretirajte kao neko svečano otvorenje. A što se tiče cilja kojeg je postavio Bukstan za promociju književnosti, mislim da u tome više stroko uspjeva i to ne samo u funkciji toga da književnost promoviše kao jedan vid umjetnosti, nego upravo onaj segment književnosti koji mnogi zanemaraju. Imamo taj problem u javnom diskursu da veoma često kada spominemo nauku i stručnu misao, odmah asocijativno pomislimo na prirodne nauke, a zaboravimo da i umjetnost se je zasnova na nekim konkretnim temeljima. Tako da mislim da ono što Bukstan ovdje postiže jeste da nas podsjeti da koliko je zanimljivo izučavati neku strukturu koja jeste utemeljena na principima, koliko je važno pričati o njoj i razviti možda neko kritičko mišljenje i podsjetiti se na važnost stručne misli. To je za početak neki uvod, a mislim da činjenica da Bukstan ima toliko mnogo prijatelja i podrške o svim projektima koji oni organizuju, potvrđuje to da je i društvo prepoznalo njegovu važnost i upravo s tim u vezi imamo par ljudi koji su izrazili svoju želju da se obrate koji jesu predstavnici određenih institucija koji nisu samo kulturne, tako da nekim hronološkim redoslijedom prozivam Anne-Marie van de Staj, zamjenicu ambasadora Kraljevine Nizozemske, da nam se kratko obrati. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, uh, it's my honor and also my pleasure uh, to address you at this year's Bookstans Literature Festival on behalf of the Netherlands uh, Embassy here in Sarajevo. Through our cultural um, diplomacy funds, we, the Netherlands, support projects that enhance bilateral and multilateral relations between us and other countries. Our society has always deeply valued cultural expression and exchange, especially in times when the world faced serious problems witnessing new divisions among peoples. Unfortunately, we are witnessing uh, this in our time as well. Having said so, uh, literacy is also a bridge from misery to hope, Kofi Annan said once. It also allows a person to step back into time uh, and learn about the life from those who walked before us. Promoting the importance of writing and literacy and reading in that regard unmistakably leads to opening our minds and our hearts, sparks joy, creates hope, and it also assists developing a critical thinking society and helps us to look ahead. By consciously supporting projects like Bookstan, our embassy provides ground for an open society where it is possible and safe for everyone to listen and also to be heard regardless of the difficulty of topics to be discussed. Freedom of expression continues to be an integral part of the Netherlands priority, also within BIH. The level of freedom is an indicator of how mature we are as a society. Freedom to exist, freedom to be, freedom to speak our minds, freedom which does not endanger, endanger the freedom of others. During this week, Bookstan will address subjects of importance for imagining the Balkans. As respected Maria Todorova's book and this year's festival title says, we are honored that also two Dutch authors will join Professor Todorova in the special program of this year's literacy festival. Uh, we have Guido Snell and Chris Keuleman jointly with renowned BH Professor Churak uh, to be here as well for the program. I'm so happy to be among such inspiring individuals today in Sarajevo. There's a saying we all know, it says great minds think alike. Well, imagine what great minds can come up with after spending time together uh, discussing literature and reality. That, exac that is exactly why some of our colleagues are eager to attend the special program taking place tomorrow, but also many of the other events already taking place today and the rest of the week. Uh, one in the, during this one-of-a-kind festival in BIH. 
Through history, culture has shown that it can truly help individuals to grow and to thrive while creating better conditions for future generations to come. We are proud to be part of this development. Allow me to emphasize that the Netherlands Embassy continues to, con to, continues to support organizations willing to be generations of change and transformation of BIH society. I wish you inspirational days and a fruitful continuation in promoting literature. Thank you very much and enjoy. Kao i što smo najavili, ovo hronološko obraćanje se nastavlja, tako da ću zamoliti zamjenicu gradonačelnici Sarajevanju, Margetić, da nam se pridruži. Dobro večer, čast mi je u ime grada Sarajeva, u ime gradonačelnice Benjamine Karići, u svoje vlastno ime, poželiti vam dobrodošlicu na ovo svečano otvorenje ovogodišnjeg bukstana. Mislim da, obzirom da sam prije dvije godine bila u ovoj ulozi, da mi je pripala čast da otvorim ovaj festival, ovaj, jeste festival književnosti, ja bi tako rekla. Sala je bila isto veliko puna, zapravo prostor, tako da mislim ekipa Bukstana da treba da traži veći prostor, definitivno, jer ovo je jedna uspješna sarajevska priča i čas mi je da grad Sarajevo je prepoznao ovu manifestaciju i da već ja ne znam, osam godina od početka smatramo da je ova manifestacija od posebnog interesa za grad i zaista jeste, jer ova priča je otišla u svijet, svijet je došao u Sarajevo, tako da želim vam i dalje jako uspješan rad, a svim građanima želim sljedeća četiri dana ispunjena maštom i put u neki bolji svijet u odnosu na svakodnevnicu. Uživajte i također u programu za najmlađe, zašto se pobrinula vrijedna ekipa Bukstana, tako da ove godine za svakoga po nešto. Uživajte u knjigama. Prijatno. Hvala vam i za kraj prozivam Srđana Mandića, načelnika općine Centar, da se isto obrati. Hvala. Dobar dan i dobrodošli u opštinu Centar. Čast je velika biti na čelu opštine koja ima i ovaj festival, ponosni smo na sve ovo što se dešava u okviru Bukstana, opština centar je podržavala, podržava i podržavat će i u buduće aktivnosti ovog festivala i sve ono što se dešava oko našeg bajbuka. Ovo je možda sad prilika da, ovo je prva u nizu manifestacija koja će se dešavati i ovog ljeta u Radiće u ovoj ulici, mi smo prije dvije godine krenuli sa nekim malim projektom koji već polako dobiva svoje obrise, a to je festival u centru i ove godine će biti puno aktivnosti. Prošle godine smo imali u sklopu našeg festivala ovdje neke evente, tako da zaista mi je zadovoljstvo i zaista se zahvaljujem od srca svoje ekipe Bukstana što radi ovo, što radi, što čuvaju i ovu umjetnost i književnost. Znamo kako vrijeme živimo i da je to sve u krizi, ali evo zahvaljujući entuzijestima, a naša je, to obstaje, a naša je obaveza i dajemo obećanje da ćemo se odazvati na svaki poziv i podržati ono što se od nas traži. Hvala vam, uživajte u narednih 3-4 dana i vidjamo se tokom ovog ljeta. Sve najbolje. Još jednom ću se zahvaliti naravno na divnim riječima, mislim da svima mogu poslužiti inspirativno, a sada ćemo prijeći na neku centralnu manifestaciju. Sam naziv, odnosno moto koji ispunjava ovogodišnji bukstan, meta informacija je onoga o čemu ćemo mi ovdje pričati i činjenica da imaginarni Balkan nije samo više postala knjiga koliko je to postao stil života kojeg mi živimo, da je to tema koja se reaktualizira stalno i iznova, upućuje na to da zaista o tome treba pričati da bi se došlo do nekih zaključaka. Temu koju će obratiti, naravno, bit će predstavljanje knjige Imaginarni Balkan prvi put na bosanskom jeziku, do sada je prevedena na 15 jezika, tu se tretira kao jedna kulturalna studija. Razgovor će voditi profesor Senad Musa Begović i naravno autorica, smatram da je suvišno spomenuti već i naziv, to je Marija Todorova i za početak bih vam mogla predstaviti par 
važnijih informacija o našim govornicima, čisto da znate u kojem okvir može ići ova tema. Marija Todorva je historičarka, njena kulturalna studija, naravno postala je poznata, ali važno je spomenuti da čak i ako se ne pročita cijeli opus ove autorice, samo po nazivima se može zaključiti da zaista Balkan jeste sfera njenog interesa, nešto što je ostalo da se istraži i nešto na čemu se treba posebno posvetiti, a se nadam Musa Begović je profesor koji je vanredni profesor na Filozofskom fakultetu u Sarajevu, izučavaju u mnogo različitih formi. Njegova doktorska disertacija je pretvorena u knjigu eseja koja jeste isto važan osvrt na bosansko-hercegovačko društvo, zatim je izdao i knjige poezije i to je čovjek koji djeluje u mnogim formama, možemo zaključiti, znači da je čovjek koji je u stanju primijeciti važne trenutke u društvu, ono što ispunjava, što definiše društvo, što definiše prošlost i sadašnjost nužno. Tako da mislim da je to neki kratki uvod dovoljan da razumijemo šta ćemo ovdje danas slušati i mislim da je ovo tema izrazito važno, tako da će zamoliti govornike da pristupe sceni. Thank you very much. It is a great honor for me to be able. Okay. It is a great honor for me to be able to talk today with Maria Todorova about the new edition of her famous book Imaginary Balkan, which was published by Bybook. In the introduction to the Bosnian edition, you mentioned Ulrich von Richtal citizen of Constance who in the 50th century made political and geographical division between Europa, Asia and Africa. Would you please tell us something about him and also about why is his so-called imaginary civilization division interesting in today's political and geostrategic context? I is, think it's, is it, it's is, okay. is, is turned out? So first let me tell you that uh, I'm really very happy to be here and I'm humbled because I am among writers and poets and I'm only a historian. Uh, and a uh, week ago I was in Albania and everybody uh, introduced me as an anthropologist. Historians are not famous. Writers and poets <laughs> are. <laughs> so I was, I'm, I'm thank you that you, you did introduce me as a historian. So Ulrich von Riefenthal uh, wrote in the 15th century uh, and uh, it seemed that uh, it, it's a, actually it's, it's, uh, it's part of the, uh, of the introduction to this new Bosnian edition. He wrote about the geographic divisions of, uh, of Europe. Uh, and he was not an idiot, uh, although it, it, it might look so. Uh, he was dividing uh, people according to their religious identities. And so he was saying that Europe is the people who are like us. He meant Christians. He meant Catholic Christians. Then he said Asia are all the people who are Muslims from North Africa down to India. And then there was Africa. And in Africa, he said, Africa has two capitals, Constantinople and Athens. So he meant the Orthodox. And for Bosnia, it was very interesting. So Bosnia, the, the, the Duke of Bosnia, who was Catholic, uh, was, was uh, uh, European. The other one was, uh, uh, was uh, African. African. Uh, th there, were no, uh, uh, there were no Muslims yet. So there, was no, there were no Asians in Bosnia. Both Bosnia was divided between those two. And uh, of course, Africa in the German understanding of the time was something which was uh, uh, outside the realm of acceptable. And so uh, that was all the people who were pagan, all the people who are uh, underground. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what I saw here was that uh, ancient Europe, o Europa, the, the ancient Europe, which was the Balkans, as, as we well know from antiquity, turned out to be Asia and Africa. Then, of course, with the Ottoman conquest, the Balkans became uh, Asia in Europe, right? Then they are back to Europe, but not quite. Uh, and, and, and so uh, uh, I, I was playing with this, but if you allow me, uh, I can play even further because now Europe is becoming bigger and that, that is something that I wrote at one point 
many years ago when the question was about the accession of Turkey. Now this is uh, probably out of the question. But at that time it was still on, the beginning of, of this century. And uh, I was musing, so if Turkey gets into Europe, and most probably Europe will expand to, to, the, to, North, to, to North Africa, which, it, which actually does. Look at the, look at the um, flirtations that the European Union is having with Morocco, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, not so um, uh, Libya, but with Tunisia, uh, with, 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 with the other Arabs. So uh, eventually, we are speaking nowadays not of Europe, we are speaking of Eurasia. But uh, I was looking at uh, cosmography, and in 50 million years, which, which is nothing in terms of uh, geological time. It's four days. Four days is, is 50 million years. In 50 million years, geographers are saying that there won't, be a, there, there won't be a Mediterranean Sea. It will be a Mediterranean mountain. And the continent will be called Afrasia. So Europe will be gone. Uh, and, and so now we want to be part of Europe, but Europe will be gone. Of course, 50 million years is too long to wait for us. But, but, but imagination is very important. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, your book was published 25 years ago, a few years after the siege of Sarajevo and genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The events presented by the Western European media as the conflict between ethnic tribes who have been at war with each other for century, who hate each other for century. I think that one of the key reasons why your book is so important is because it demystifies these conceptions. Can you tell me something about this presentation of the war in Bosnia and how this connects with your book of the imaginary Balkan? Uh, well, it's an old book, so I'm amazed that it is still alive and people are reading it. Um, uh, I mean, now it turns that it is an emancipatory project, this book, but it was not conceived as, a, as, as such. Um, at a very inductive level, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is the attempt to problematize uh, a discourse uh, or a description, ideological description, which pushes away and silences the marginal or the liminal, which the Balkans are. Uh, I was, at that time, I was, uh, I, res I resented the ghettoization, the ghettoization of the Balkans because the division was, of course, after 1989, uh, we accept the Central Europeans, they have this legacy, the Habsburg legacy, they are civilized, and we want to ghettoize uh, the, the Balkans. I resented that. And when the Yugoslav war came, of course, there was this moral outrage that all the stereotypes, which, which are historical, they are not forever, they, they uh, blew up and, and, and they were used mostly by journalists. So uh, poets and writers I like, journalists I uh, less so, but uh, excuse the journalists here, uh, but, but, but they like uh, easy, easy scripts. Um, but, uh, but in fact, uh, you, you might be surprised, the book was written not because of that. The first thing of the book was the last chapter, which was the realia of the Balkans. And I, ironically, I said, uh, qu'est-ce qu'il y a hors de texte, right? Uh, you know, playing with uh, Derrida. Um, so uh, this was, in fact, the first chapter that I wrote, uh, much before I conceived of the book. Because, as a historian, I'm interested in realia, in, in what the Balkans are. And so I wrote it for a, uh, for a volume on, uh, on Ottoman uh, legacies, uh, legacies in the, in the Middle East. And, uh, in fact, what there is, uh, is a, um, in my mind, a, a kind of a quarrel between structuralism and post-structuralism. Uh, as a historian, uh, I, I realize that nowadays, of course, positivistic history is impossible. Uh, with the linguistic turn, of course, we write uh, historical cri critical history. But, uh, but uh, structuralism is still very much present 
And there is a good reason for that. And when I say structuralism, I don't mean, of course, uh, Trubetskoy and Jakobson and uh, Saussure, or, or uh, Levi, uh, uh, not Lévi-Strauss, but I mean the, uh, this uh, sociological functionalism of Marx, Weber, or Durkheim, of which, as a historian, I've been very much influenced. And so uh, nowadays, I think that uh, I still want to retain this very important structuralist analysis, but uh, modified by a post-structuralism which plays attention to positionality, uh, to, uh, to reflectivity. Um, and so that's it. <laughs> That was a good end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Obviously, you have been inspired by Edward Said's book, Orientalism, where he defined Orient as the an another of the West. Orient is that what constructing image, idea, experience through which the West defined itself. And Balkan has an interesting role in this. In other words, the ancient Greece is the place of the origin of the foundation of the Western civilization. Yet Europe perceived the Balkan Peninsula as non-modern, backward, primitive, shaped by the savage consciousness. Would you comment the fact that the Balkan is part of Europe, its center, but at the same time, Balkan is perceived as backward and savage? Thank you. Uh you are surprising me with your questions, but then I will surprise you with an answer. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I was not inspired by Eduard. I, I like Eduard Said very much, but I was not inspired by him because I, uh, when I, uh, so, so I had read him and, uh, and I called, my book was called Balkanism when I gave it to Oxford. And then my editor said, you should not call it Balkanism because it looks very much like, uh, I knew, of course, Said's book. It looks very much like Orientalism. In the 1990s, Said was not liked in the United States. He was considered to be, I mean, this was the rise of the hawks, uh, the anti-Arab feeling. Uh, there were the, these dirty uh, the discussions between Bernard Lewis and Edward Said. And I was angered. I said, no. Edward Said is great, and so I wrote my introduction dedicated to Edward Said. It was not in the original of the book. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, she said, but at least change the title. And I said, how can I change the title? I cannot call it something stupid like imagining the Balkans. Yes, she said, this is the, the perfect title. <laughs> So uh, the difference that I see, and I, I wrote about that, uh, again, I, I like, he, he's an inspiring author, but he's very much a literary critic. And um, although there is something, although there is, uh, all right, be better? Although he writes about his own predicament as a Palestinian, uh, he, he tends to overgeneralize, which is, which is normal. He writes about the Orient in general, and because it is overgeneralized, it can also be generalizable. And it has been generalized not only about the Arab Middle East, as he intended to, but also about India, about uh, China, about all the Orient. And orientalizing is, of course, uh, a, a term nowadays which, which simply means uh, stereotypical uh, attitudes. Uh, and uh, as a historian, <laughs> I, I very much like specificity. And I, I was trying to see uh, where the Balkans are in this, uh, in, in this case. Uh, and uh, I, I saw differences. Of course, he speaks about racial, uh, racial uh, uh, prejudices, and I don't see that uh, in the attitude toward the Balkans. Where I see the attitude is about the notion of backwardness. But if, if one has to be very primitive, it, it's about the notion of material backwardness, 
of material poverty, which, which of course grids the Western gaze, not so much, uh, not so much intellectual poverty, which uh, uh, we Balkanites happen to not accept, but but material poverty is there, and th th this is where uh, you have this uh, this type of uh, prejudice, especially nowadays. I think I can speak in this. <laughs> you commented uh, on the theories uh, of some Western historians, more specif specifically on their argument that the Balkan did not modernize itself or emancipate itself because it did not go through the experience of the humanism and renaissance due to the fact that it was part of the Ottoman Empire. But at the same time, the experience of the empires rests on the multiculturalism, on the intertwining of cultures and religions, something that West does, West does not know much about. It is actually you who pointed out on several instances in your book that the West considered Balkan as backward because, because cultures and religions coexist and intertwine on its territory. I, maybe it's a surprise question. Uh, do, do <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, the Balkanist uh, the discourse and this, uh, uh, this uh, stereotypes was, was something which was historical. It was not always there. It was coined only uh, in the second half of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when, uh, when uh, the empire was disintegrating and out of this empire came small small countries, uh, small states which were struggling, uh, they were uh, trying to modernize, and this was at a time where the West was looking down upon Kleinstaaterei. Uh, you have at one point the uh, unification of Germany, the unification of Italy, and all of a sudden you have this plethora of new, uh, new countries that are speaking all these different uh, languages. But in fact, the word Balkanization was not coined when the, Balkan, when the Ottoman Empire was disintegrating, but it was coined when the Habsburg Empire and the Russian Empire was disintegrating. And all of a sudden you have uh, you know, the Baltics, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, all, Austria, Hungary uh, appearing, and this looked like the Balkan states a hundred years uh, previously, and that is when the when the notion of Balkanization was coined. So there was an unease uh, in the already uh, in the already stable nation states of the of the West. That here you have new arrivals, uh, new, new newcomers who are upstarts. Uh, who are trying to uh, to to, uh, to modernize? Uh, so, in, in some ways, I was joking that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 final Europeanization of the uh, of, of of Europe is is coming uh, in the Balkans because they are creating homogeneous nation states, just like uh, Western Europe had already created in the previous uh, three or four centuries. Because they had done it in the same way, uh, by, by cleansing, by kicking out uh, uh, minorities, by killing minorities, by, by genocides, uh, and they managed to create these pretty stable nation states. Uh, in, in terms of uh, economy, of course, uh, it, it has nothing to do with, uh, with the Balkans. Uh, they, you know, you have to look at World Systems Theory. Uh, the economy changes. Uh, you know, Italy was the center of the world, as you know, well know, uh, uh, until the 15th century. Then it was uh, Amsterdam, then it was London. Now it's New York, and now it's not New York any longer. So, uh, you know, the economic centers, uh, you know, change, and uh, the peripheries around the economic centers are left as uh, peripheries. So the, the, the Balkans, in this sense, uh, have always been a periphery, except during the Ottoman Empire, when the Balkans were the center, in some ways, of the, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, also economically. <laughs> Sorry. Samuel Huntington mm. argue that the borders that exist between Austro-Hungarian Empire and Ottoman Empire are today borders of civilization, the only relevant ones after the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
My argument is, actually this is not only my opinion, is that the, the war in this area did not happen because of the incompatible cultures, because people here have contrasting costumes, contrasting perspectives of the world and opposite civilization values. It was because culture and people are very similar. They mixed up, intertwining the gladness, the fact that they did not have common past since they lived in the different empires, Habsburg Empire and Ottoman one. Uh, first of all, Huntington, b b people have forgotten about Huntington, so this, this theory is gone. N nobody takes it. Uh, no, no, honestly, n nobody takes it uh, serious. It, w it was actually uh, instrumentalized very much during the time of Central, verse, uh, Central, Central Europe versus the, the Balkans, and it wanted to cut out uh, Orthodox uh, Europe, but the Greeks were already inside, so it was a little bit difficult to do it even uh, in this, uh, in this uh, sense. Um, what, what happened was that political scientists uh, took the, the view that they have to insert some history in their thinking, so they, they, they came out with uh, more attention uh, to, uh, to, his, to history. But apart from hunting, and I totally agree that uh, the wars uh, are not because of ancient hatreds, people are very much the same, uh, but, but we should not go as far as romanticizing also uh, empires. So uh, I, I can tell you that uh, while I was still in Bulgaria, I was teaching the Ottoman, uh, you know, Ottoman Empire as an Ottomanist, and I was always explaining that this is not a black hole, it's not a dark age, there is something interesting in that. When I came to, when I went to the States, States and I still have courses on the Ottoman Empire, I had to do the reverse because my students who are living in an empire like empires. They like the Ottoman Empire and they could not understand why nationalism is, why there is nationalism. So I had to explain to them why there is opposition also to empires. So it, again, it, it, it depends, but, but honestly, absolutely I do agree with you, uh, it is, it is not. Uh, it is not the ancient hatreds. It is the, uh, the, the, the disentanglement of this imperial legacy. Once you create nation states that tend to be homogenous, because homogeneity is supposed to be stability, and in some ways it is. Uh, this entanglement is very difficult, especially in in, in places where you have like Bosnia. Which, where the entanglement is, is really, uh, you know, it's, it's a cauldron. Uh, and, and there are other places in empires which are very, very central. This disentanglement is, is creating this type of uh, conflict because, because of the idealization of the nation states. But again, the other, the other point is also not to idealize empires too much. <coughs> It is interesting how Balkan people accept the idea of European national self-determination. In fact, that is the European nation, you said this, uh, or one can say that is a European construct. However, European condemns Balkan people because of their ethnic nationalism, which is different from the civil nationalism, since in the civil nationalism is the will of the citizens that it represents, not the will of the tribes and Europe condemns the aggression of the Balkan nationalism because it reflects Eastern mentality. Can we say that Europe does not reflect, uh, Europe does not want to admit to itself that such aggression and violence is the basis on his notion of the national self-determination or the violence and aggression that Europe will fully conduct. And now Balkan ethnical nationalism are just imitating this Europe type of nationalism from the time when it was just forming itself. Maybe you said this, something about this, but I think you And also I want to ask you, you said this homogenization, but homogenization have, we have all always by with immigration and assimilation. This is the problem in our whole minority. I mean, what, what can I say? You, you, you said what I've been saying in the book. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, if, 
if I can give you a drastic, maybe, maybe even a vulgar example, which I gave at one point uh, to, to illustrate the hypocrisy of how uh, the West is looking at the Balkans. Uh, it, it actually happened in Vienna during the Yugoslav War. Uh, and I was at a panel, and there were two uh, Austrian uh, anthropologists and actually friends of mine who had written a paper which was called Töten mit Messer, killing with, uh, you know, with, with knives, to illustrate how bloody and primitive uh, the, the war is in, in the former Yugoslavia. And I said, and, and then they asked me, why do you object to that? And I said, listen, I'm coming now from the Lessingplatz, in the, the ones of you who have been in Vienna know the Lessingplatz, and there is a there is a um, medieval house there, and there is an inscription. Uh, in 1421, it's in Latin, uh, the Lupi Judaici were burnt in this house. So I said, if you look at a tradition of Toten mit Messer in the Balkans, can I say that you are, have a tradition of burying people, especially Jews, from the 15th century on until the 20th century? And they were, uh, they were stupefied. Uh, they said, but isn't that vulgar? I said, yes, it is vulgar, but it is as vulgar as uh, your own notion. So uh, in, in some ways, uh, if you calmly respond to such notions, it doesn't work. If you confront them with their own history, then they are a little bit taken aback. Thank you. In your book, you talk about Balkan wars those from 1912-13, and the way in which Europe was both outraged and fascinated by the violence, by, by that violence. However, only a few years after that, Europe stopped in the bloody First World War. Isn't it also interesting that during this time, the majority of the European intellectual elite accept the violent, violence as the way of the national regeneration survival and the progress. So actually all, all, all European intellectuals support nationalist project of the, during First World War. And maybe you mentioned social democracy, maybe it is very interesting to say something yeah. about it. Well, um, I mean, listen, first of all, the First World War uh, is at the height of nationalism. You know, the 19th century until, uh, until now, I mean, Hobsbawm was thinking that nationalism will disappear by the end of the uh, 20th century. It is not disappearing. We are still living in the age of uh, nationalism, despite all the, uh, you know, talks about globalization. Uh, but, but this is the height of nationalism. Uh, and so it's not that all intellectuals supported Violence, but they did support their uh, national, uh, you know, their national, their their, uh, you know, the, the the national program during the uh, during the First World War. And the exception are some social democrats. And interestingly enough. Uh, Th th this was the time of the Second International, and this is my last book. Um, there were only four parties of, among the Social Democrats which voted against the war and the, uh, the, the war debts. And these were the uh, Italian, the Serbian, the Bulgarian, the Social Democratic parties, and the left side of the Russian Duma. Only four. Uh, everybody else decided to support their, their, their nations. Uh, but, but, but to say about uh, the, uh, the uh, Balkan Wars, they, they were violence. They were violent. And the fact that uh, Europe at that point was uh, shocked uh, is also normal because uh, there were several decades of, uh, of uh, non-aggression, uh, um, non of, of uh, lack of wars in Europe, uh, la belle époque. So uh, it, uh, intellectuals were, were shocked at what was happening in the Balkans, and it was not beautiful. It was ugly. Uh, but, but it is true that uh, it, it is minimal compared to what was happening during the uh, First World War. In fact, when the uh, Carnegie Endowment wrote 
uh, the the piece, you know, the original one in 1914, uh, just before the uh, the uh, beginning of the First World War, uh, it was a very very well documented thing, uh, and I have nothing against it. Uh, I was against the fact that when the Yugoslav War happened, and it was a Yugoslav War, not a Balkan War, uh, Kenan and uh, and all the West began speaking about about the Third Balkan War uh, because it coincided with this moment where the accession to Europe was happening. So you ghettoize all the Balkans in order not uh, to, to allow for the uh, accession and use uh, this event uh, for, the, for the sake of, uh, uh, of uh, kicking them out. I find another war very important. This is the war between Greece and Turkey in, 22, in 1922. Be I, uh, sorry. I find it important because this, there we have something which we call this humanitarian emigration. But what's happened? Most of the people who are living in um, uh, Saloniki, Saloniki, who are Muslims, they become Turks. And a lot of Orthodox people who are living in Turkey in Lisbon, they become Greeks. Maybe, originally, at least they are not Greeks or even Turks. Their religion was Orthodox or Muslims. These divisions start to be very sharp and very, um, very violent. And also, there is a model how to use religion to have some sort of national division between the people. And I think that is something what's very similar happened in ex-Yugoslavia. Even Franjo Tuđman said that this is a model which is very good. Maybe we should apply this kind of the model. You mean the division? The yeah, migration of the humanitarian migration of the people that you can uh, who are minority how you can find solution for minority just put them in a territory where they are majority Spain and everything. Well, of course, but 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 this but this is the logic of any nation state, uh, and and the biggest exchange is of course India and Pakistan. I mean, this is one of, of global dimensions, much much uh, bloodier than anything that happened between Greece and Turkey, of course, with the Lausanne Treaty. Um, it, it's not all. Uh, so uh, Orthodox in Izmir were Greeks. There, there is no question. Uh, the the uh, in, not in Salonika, but there were some in Cyprus who were uh, you know who, who spoke only Greek and then uh, went uh, or the Pontiac Greeks who were uh, speaking Turkish, but they had an ethnic uh, identity which was Greek. So uh, it is is it's it's not as it is not as tragic actually as uh, in Yugoslavia where you al already had even a Yugoslav identity uh, which which was not the case in uh, uh, in, uh, in in Turkey and in Greece uh, but, but as I said uh, it's the logic of any kind of uh, homogeneous nation state and uh, and on a global on a global level uh, again we are pretty modest in our bloodshed <laughs> I think it is possible to develop the, crit the critique of the Balkan nationalism and at the same time to not fall into the Western European stereotype which proclaim people of the Balkan as backward, narrow-minded, provincial, not modern, etc. Also, you know, how to criticize the Balkan nationalism to don't say, okay, you are provincial, you are, yeah. So is it possible to criticize? I mean, how, how, how? how to criticize it? I mean, I hate exclusions, so... <laughs> uh, Homogenization is exclusion also. Well, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so the moment you don't have, uh, uh, you don't have a war, of course, you look uh, across the border, you find commonalities, and we can find commonalities, of course. And they are linguistic, they are cultural, they are uh, musical, they are all all types of co uh, commonalities. And this is the way uh, nationalism can be uh, can be uh, b broken. When I say that we are still living in the uh, age of nationalism, it is a downward spiral. It's not the height of nationalism. Uh, so I think that nationalism uh, in the long run might actually disappear, but not in the short run, because in the end, uh, you know, healthcare is 
national. It's the national government which pays the pensions. It's the national government which pays the, the salaries. So in, in some ways, uh, nationalism is institutionalized and we cannot really fight against the, these institutions. It, it, it is there. Um, so, uh, but little by little, uh, sovereignty, uh, I mean, with the European Union, if it, if it doesn't become too bureaucratized, it is taking away, uh, you know, a little, little, little bit of sovereignty, and that is actually a good thing, because this is the way to, to also break down uh, the national institutions and uh, eventually nationalism, but very slowly. And uh, how did Bulgarian intellectual perceive socialist Yugoslavia in the time when Tito tried to establish policy of self-management and the third wave which resisted the bloc division? This is uh, I mean, it's not only Bulgaria, all the Eastern Bloc was uh, looking up to Yugoslavia. They liked what Yugoslavia was doing, expect, expect, uh, uh, except Albania, uh, for good reasons. Uh, but uh, but, but the, all the others liked it, uh, Bulgaria in particular. You, you might remember that in '48 there was an attempt to, uh, to do a... Uh, customs union between Yugoslavia, Tito and uh, Dimitrov and Stalin, uh, Stalin uh, stopped that. So B Bulgaria was looking uh, with, with uh, uh, envy at what Yugoslavia uh, had. And in fact, uh, after 68, kind of sotto voce, not, not rhetorically e explicit, but there was a, a slacking of the regime. Uh, there was more of the uh, elements of, of the Yugoslav, uh, of the Lug Yugoslav experiment, but not as far as, uh, as the Yugoslavs went, went, because in the Yugoslav case by the 18s, by the 80s, this decentralization, in fact, uh, uh, led to, to the disintegration. So it was very positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe about something on the non-alignment movement, because in fact, uh, in fact, back the, then, he, he talk, introduced the, to Europe of the third world country, Asia and Africa. I think that is a political vision is directly confronting, is confronting uh, idea of Huntington's of clash of civilization. Can this be reason why this is, is the solution of Yugoslavia? Because, you know, when you said that Huntington is not important anymore, but I'm not so sure now with the war in Russia and everything was going on. War in Russia is between, uh, you know, this, in, in the same culture. Huntington, for Huntington, it's on the on the other side of the of the border. So it's a it's a inner war. So it's 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 not a war between uh, between his uh, uh, border. Uh, the non-aligned movement uh, is, of course, the uh, you know the. the uh, charismatic characteristic of, uh, of Yugoslavia. But, uh, and I have, in fact, a, a graduate student who writes about that. It turns out that uh, most of these so socialist uh, uh, countries had very, very good relations with uh, uh, the, the so-called third world, with India, with Africa, but not in the way that Tito, uh, uh, Tito narrated it. And I think that you know, Tito was a great politician who uh, managed to maneuver very well between uh, the first, the second, and the third world. Uh, I don't think that uh, this non-aligned movement uh, did, uh, did achieve something uh, you know, very substantive, but it was a very nice uh, idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, would you please tell us uh, if and how it would be possible to create transcultural, transcultural conscience for the Balkan people, considering which is open to the common future, not only to speak about past, common past, you know, how it can be in the future connection between the Balkanian people? Funnily enough, uh, this ghettoization of the Balkans, in fact, b brought Balkan peoples to, uh, people together. And uh, b before, before the Yugoslav War, Bulgaria was the only Balkan country. 
right? The Yugoslavs were looking down upon the East. Uh, they were not Balkan. All of a sudden, uh, they discovered that they were Balkan. Uh, the Greeks, uh, the Greeks were always playing between uh, Mediterranean and Balkan. But after '89, they liked to be Balkan because this was the the place where they were the most uh, developed, where they had great investments, where they could uh, find uh, cheap labor. So they liked to be also Balkan. Um, in the Romanian case, also uh, they were until today. They are playing between uh, Central Europeanists and their uh, Balkanists. And as I uh, wrote, uh, uh, I had a couple of emails telling me, uh, Romania is not Balkan. But then they complained, why do you write so few about Romania? You should write more about it <laughs> right in the book. So uh, everybody all of a sudden recognizes this Balkanist. And in music, uh, so, so nowadays you have you writers and poets are in the forefront of that. You have uh, these uh, poetic things in Prespa, uh, so uh, where Balkan people are coming, artists are coming together, uh, B Balkan artists. Uh, so I think it, it's in the air. It was uh, it was one time uh, in the interwar period uh, with, with the Balkan institutes and the creation of a Balkan uh, a Balkan Entente which was at that point, of course, anti-Bulgarian because Bulgaria was the revisionist country. But nonetheless, it brought culturally the Balkans. And now I think there is the momentum to do it uh, again. Um, because essentially there are, with a few exceptions, and you know which they are, but there are no more territorial issues, I think, in the Balkans. I mean, you have a little bit of Kosovo, you have a little bit in Bosnia, but, 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 but not otherwise. You know, uh, Greeks and Bulgarians used to be at their throat. Greeks and Turks, um, but but but, but uh, you know, more or less, uh, I think these these problems are solved. Yeah, <laughs> with with a few exceptions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe we can ask audience if they have some question to open this to have open discussion. And yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your book primarily and then also for this presentation. Um, I would like to ask a question that many of my students who are assigned your book ask. Where is the agency of the Balkan people in this kind of double representation, you know, uh, representing the Balkans in the way in which they are represented? That we try to resolve it is and, and I wonder how you uh, how you see this question of agency in the context of when you wrote it then and then and then perhaps nowadays. So where do you see how the, the, this agency has changed? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, there is no agency there because I was reacting against... Uh, uh, so th the power of the book is its uh, discursive exegesis. That, that's it. Um, agency was not fashionable in those days. So, uh, you know, in, in humanities we have different uh, uh, fashions. Uh, it, it is a top-down representation. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a discursive exegesis. I think uh, my last book on the Social Democrats is a bottom-up thing, where I'm looking at the agency of the periphery. And I think this can be done not by a general discourse, which I was trying to do, a structural, post-structural discourse, but by doing micro-histories. Of, of the type of, of the Italian um, microstoria. Uh, so uh, the, the micro histories allow you to, uh, to show individual agency 
if you are smart enough to put them in a context which is larger, where they can also open up uh, other fields and other concepts. But uh, so what you have to uh, tell your students is that it's a book written 25 years ago, which where it, uh, the other thing is where is race and where is gender? Well, it's not there, right? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, I, I was asked when I was doing my social democrats, but we are writing mostly about men. Where is gender? Well, I said they were men, right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I mean, uh, th th these are uh, so it, it depends on what you are uh, what you are uh, researching in the end. <laughs> yes. Je peux parler uh, sans le micro. Merci. Excusez-moi cinq langues, mm. euh, français, russe et, et surtout bo bosniaque, euh, euh, serbe et c'est tout. Mais c'est dommage que je n'ai pas eu possibilité d'écouter euh, votre discours. Mm. C'est dommage, il faut, il faut dire quelques phrases. Surtout trop court dans la langue. Vous remercie. Et peut-être nous pouvons parler en russe. Ça serait un grand plaisir pour moi. Uh, in your book, you spoke about two Europes on the European continent. One is uh, Europe uh, is uh, Vatican Europe, and the other is uh, so Byzantine Europe. Uh, uh, is that consequence this concept that we have uh, two Europes? We have on one continent. One is Byzantine, and other is uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, Europe, uh, how can the, this war is, is excuse me, uh, in Ukraine? Is that war between th these two Europes, and the uh, the existence of two different Europes? Uh, can they live together peacefully in the future? And the consequence of the current situation on Balkan in Bosnia, existence of two Europes. Um, uh, I never spoke of two Europes, it's Huntington's, hunt, that, that, that is the Huntington idea of two Europes. The Ukraine crisis is not between uh, Catholic and uh, Orthodox thing. In fact, what you have is uh, a, 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 you know, a crackdown on the, uh, on the Orthodox. The Orthodox Church in, in, the, in Ukraine is divided. You have the westernmost part, which is indeed uh, Catholic, uh, which was uh, a part of the, uh, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. But uh, the rest is very much Orthodox. And you have two Orthodox churches. One which uh, was uh, recognized as an autocephalous church by uh, Patriarch Bar Bartholomeus, and the other one which was under the uh, uh, Russian Patriarchate, and this Russian, uh, uh, this Ukrainian church was cracked down, was forbidden uh, by the uh, by the Zelensky regime. So I don't think that the, it's a fight between these two Huntingtonian Europes, not at all. Uh, it, it, it is a, a fight uh, uh, which has other dimensions in which uh, I don't want to get into. Okay. 
Uh, good evening. My name is Chiara Maria and I'm uh, very, very happy and enthusiastic uh, about the fact that I have the chance to listen to you speaking about a book that uh, really, I mean, I could see that it's really a turning point in my academic studies. Uh, so thank you for that, for having written that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can put the agency and actually my question would be uh, kind of related to that. Uh, so you while you were reimagining, let's say, the Balkans, uh, you pinpointed uh, how identity and the discourse that uh, mm, creates identity is a very much a dichotomic process. So as far as Said also uh, underlined, there is no East, uh, there is no West without the East, and maybe there is no West, also if we apply this discourse in Europe, there is no Western Europe without the Balkans. Uh, in this sense, I also believe that sometimes the European Union, in order to be so and to define itself, uh, also as the peacekeeper of the continent, needs the Balkan, as much as the Balkans need Europe. So my question would be, what does it take nowadays to reimagine not only the Balkans, but what does it take to reimagine Europe? I live here, I study here in Sarajevo, I've been living also here and in Belgrade, uh, spent exactly like half of the time standing here than in Italy. And uh, I always uh, confront myself with a question, like people are asking me, where are you? I'm in Europe. Uh, people from here often refer to Western Europe as Europe, as if here we were in Asia or something else. And I'm still, it's a big question mark for me. Uh, so yeah, I'm very, very concerned about this question. What is Europe and how can we imagine Europe without necessarily thinking of the Balkans as a passive constituent of it. Thank you. I mean, there are different Europes. There is a geographic Europe, there is a cultural Europe, and so when people are saying uh, that we are going to Europe, that that's, uh, we, we, are go we are going to the rich part of of the continent. Th this is what they mean. Uh, or, or to the civilized part of the continent. But nev nevertheless, each of the, of the people from here, if they are in Asia or in America, they will say we are European. Right? And there will be no question about the fact that they are European. N n not by the observers, not by themselves. So if you are in America, uh, a, a Bosnian and a Norwegian will come together. Uh, you know, so again, it, it depends on how you are positioned and where you are positioned vis-a-vis -vis something. Um, so uh, how to overcome it? It's, uh, uh, I mean, it's by contact, uh, it, it's by questioning uh, these, these uh, uh, categories, right, by, by, by denying their, uh, their explicit, their absolute, their absolute uh, value, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, other than that, uh, I mean, you yourself are hesitant to put an identity to yourself, right? You are living here and there and elsewhere. People are like this. All of us have multiple identities. So uh, I was asked once, where do you feel more comfortable? In America or in Europe? I said, in the middle of the ocean, if, the, <laughs> if, if, the, if it's not falling down, of course. Right, uh, so I mean, uh, you, you feel at home, uh, right? Uh, and then, of course, it's not only the ethnic. I mean, we are always speaking about ethnic categories. We feel at home here because it's an educated minority, right? And you identify with this minority, uh, with the writers, with the, with the people, who are, with intellectuals. Uh, you go out and you will, you will feel, uh, you know, a, a more, uh, you, you will uh, be, be more at one with, with, with your counterpart, I don't know, in China rather than uh, with, with some Bosnian who, who doesn't know what you're sp speaking about. So again, the, the social cleavages and class cleavages are also very important we, we, and we, we, we tend to forget about, the, uh, about them because we are so focused on these ethnic identities. Uh, 
Ukoliko smo završili sa pitanjima, ovaj događaj, prvi dio u stvari otvaranja je gotov. Ja ću vas zamoliti da svi koji su zainteresovani knjigu mogu uzeti naravno u knjižari, ali dobiti i potpis na već posjedujuću knjigu. I drugi dio manifestacije se nastavlja poslije u pola devet, kada nastavljamo sa koncertom Ahmeda Burića. To će biti zaista zanimljiv spoj poetskog i muzičkog, pa eto pozivam vas da se i tu pridružite. Hvala.